Hi and welcome back. And are you ready for the second part of the Bernardo Provenzano video? Well, buckle up. Now, during the 1970s, Bernardo Provenzano enters a new phase of his life as a fugitive. Once Leggio was arrested, Provenzano became the interim boss of his district, together with Toto Raina. The police believe that during this period, the mafioso was hiding in Bagheria. That's a town close to the suburbs of Palermo. In this area, Provenzano was busy investing dirty money in many different activities to, of course, launder it. In particular, he's interested in the real estate market. Not sure why, but for some reason, criminals just love real estate. Maybe because you can deploy lots of money very quickly. You rarely lose its value. And of course, you can always kind of make up a story of how you happen to get that real estate in the first place. Just speculating there, but I may be onto something. Anyway, I digress. So let's get back to the story. Now, the fugitive Provenzano in these years also finds love and marries in 1970 with Cinisi Saveria Benedetta Palozzolo, a shirt maker coming from a family that was entangled with the mafia. Now, shortly after the wedding, Bernardo decides to build a beautiful house in the countryside in which to live with his bride. But his plans are interrupted because an inspection of the Carabinieri, the Italian police, does not allow him to complete the work. Now, as you know from our videos on Messina Denaro and Tommaso Buscetta, that, though of course, you should definitely check out, mafia men were expected to be married and loyal to their wives. Buscetta, in particular, was treated with disrespect by many mafia men because he was a feminare or playboy. Now, if the marriage represents a moment of relative serenity in the life of Provenzano, it hasn't distracted him from his ambitions. And in 1981, he gets the opportunity to definitely conquer new power. And that's in connection with the Second Mafia War and the season of massacres. In fact, in 1981, Provenzano, Raina and Bagarella unleashed a season of conflict and violence that would later become known as the Second Mafia War. Now, the reason for the struggles lay in the great ambition of these three mafiosi and in the internal instability of the organisation. In the period between 1981 and 1984, the Corleonese clan gained more and more power and established itself at the top of the mafia hierarchy. Once the rivals had been eliminated, the new bosses created a renewed commission in which only Raina and Provenzano's loyalists resided. In this period, Bernardo also protects Vito Ciancimino, the political connection of the clan, the man who was within the government and therefore could assist the Corleonese with any political support that they would ever need. Once the roles of power had been established, the new commission moved in the direction of a terrorist-like approach and a direct attack on the state. Now, this is one of the fundamental differences with the American Mafia that rarely killed cops or FBI agents and rarely, therefore, challenged the government directly. But the Sicilian Mafia did. And it's interesting to note, in fact, that an American Mafia turncoat called Michael Franzesi, one of the few people who actually left the Mafia and lived to tell the tale, said he would not go to Sicily or Italy because he said someone in the Mafia there may want to attempt to kill him. No surprise. The level of resentment and the comfort with open violence, even against people protected by the government, is still very striking. Many honest law enforcement people like uh, Nini Cesara, Beppe Montana and Antonina Saeta are eliminated one by one. Provenzano also directs some famous attacks such as that of Via D'Amelio, where the magistrate Borsellino and his bodyguards lost their lives. And, of course, the massacre of Capacci, which result in the killing of Giuseppe Falcone and his wife. Provenzano's co-head and loyal friend, Totoraina, was arrested in 1993. And Provenzano, at that point, becomes a sort of reference figure that will decide the future of the organisation. Bernardo is convinced that the time has come to maintain a low profile following the arrest of Bagarella. The period of the attacks must now end. Now the Mafia needs to act in silence in order to infiltrate society and, and become more powerful. 
He understands that a direct challenge to the state will always result in a strong reaction by the police, which of course then limits the mafia's ability to run its affairs. So he then decides to pass to the command of the Corleone clan, Giovanni Brusca, receiving in exchange the title of Boss of Bosses. He knows power is best kept in the shadows, so Provenzano leaves the scene once again and limits murders and sensational activities to the minimum. The same police forces are convinced of his death because his wife and family return to live and work in Corleone. Provenzano goes back to being invisible. But in reality, he continues to maintain a dense network of contacts that allow him to carry out his illegal activities. His first collaborator is his wife, who over the years proves to be just not a simple shirt maker, but a real criminal entrepreneur. Owner of an immense asset base, she becomes owner of two companies that are a cover to launder dirty money. In 1990, she herself is convicted and sentenced to three years in jail, then reduced to two. But she doesn't serve them because, like her husband, she manages to hide herself. She reappears sometime later in Corleone with her children still underage, ready to lead an apparently normal life because she is protected from the pressures of justice. Mrs. Provenzana, however, continues to communicate with her husband, to whom she remains, of course, utterly faithful and somehow helps him to stay in touch with his, with his collaborators and allies. Bernardo is not called the accountant by chance. In fact, he has a brilliant, intuitive mind and invents a code to give directives to his affiliates and seek the alliance of politicians and men of power. His messages arrive through the Pizzini tickets, and they're tickets written by hand and by typewriters and closed with a knot. And it's thanks to these Pizzini that Bernardo manages to remain hidden and remain unarrested for 43 years. Even the new technologies don't succeed in opening a breach in that iron barrel that he's built up around himself over the years. He knows that technology can be traced. His system prevents tracing because it's so primitive, but equally safe. His collaborators warn him about the ease of intercepting messages on cell phones, and the boss of bosses listens to their advice, continuing to use his typewriter and blank sheets of paper to maintain his relationship with the outside world. But despite the brilliant moves, in the end, it's the Pizzini that reveal Provenzano's hiding place to law enforcement. The notes are, in fact, found in some packages of groceries and clean laundry. Bernardo was never far away, and in fact, He's been hiding for almost 50 years, not far from his own family, in a very simple cottage. And this is one of the crazy things about the Sicilian Mafia in particular. They make billions of dollars in illegal activities, but they often live like peasants and farmers. Power is what they seek versus the luxuries of life. This is very different from Messina Denaro and Buscetta, who both love their good life, and from the South American drug lords Pablo Escobar and Chapo Guzman. And by the way, uh, any interest in hearing more about those two, as always, if there's anything that piques your interest, just drop us a comment in the comments below. and We'll look into whatever it is that you want us to tell you about. So anyway, back to Provenzano's arrest. Now, it's April the 11th, 2006, when the dawn raid takes place in Provenzano's house. The mafioso doesn't put up any resistance, but only asks to have the necessary supplies for his injection that he must have following a prostate operation. And it was this very operation, which took place in 2002, which represented the first episode that actually led to the tracking of the mafioso and was the prelude to his arrest. In fact, the mafioso had taken a fake identity in order to have the operation for prostate cancer. The mysterious death of the urologist and the discovery of Provenzano's photo on the forged identity card had then prompted law enforcement to research the case more deeply. We actually do have a video on the death of that surgeon on our channel, which is pretty interesting. It's really sad that his death was disguised as a suicide and was in fact likely a murder just to get rid of him as a witness, poor chap. Provenzano spent the rest of his life in prison, slowly losing his power and his physical and mental health. In 2012, he attempted suicide and in 2016, he died at the San Paolo Hospital in Milan after a long illness. 
Despite the weakening of his health and the benefits he would have had if he'd just caved, Provenzano never cooperated with justice. Just like Raina, he died in silence. Until next time, ciao.